the title of our study, you should be able to see that on the screen, is The Other Jesus. This is what we're going to be talking about, The Other Jesus. Uh, you might be wondering what other Jesus, you know, so there's only one Jesus. There is indeed only one true Jesus, but there's also uh, a fake Jesus. There is another Jesus. And it's not just one, it's actually more than one. That's what we want to discuss today. Uh, one of the things in the world that happens more frequently now than, than before is, uh, particularly because of the internet, is the prevalence and existence of uh, scams, deceptions. Con artists. Now, con artists have been with us down through history, uh, but with the internet and, and communication being so easy, and it's so easy to impersonate someone and pretend to be something that you are not, it is very prevalent. Uh, a famous uh, con man, whose name is actually still with us to this day, uh, was Charles Ponzi. You might not know him by this particular name, but you might be familiar with what is uh, commonly known as a Ponzi scheme. And the Ponzi scheme is really a, a false uh, scam type of scheme set up that promises great financial gain, uh, but ends up stealing people's money. Uh, finds its name, or it, its name is actually based on Charles Ponzi, who was one of the you know people who pioneered that particular style of scamming and, and conning people and promising them something which is not realistic. Pretending to be someone else or pretending to promise uh, outcomes that are very beneficial, but in reality it is false. And so it is a con, and so it is a scam, is actually a very sad tragedy. Uh, in a much more important way, we have a greater deception that the Apostle Paul talks about, that he warns the believers about. And this deception, you can actually call it a con, a great con, a great, uh, you know, Ponzi, so to speak. It doesn't have to do with the financial, uh, a financial type of deception. It has to do with the person of Jesus Christ. It has everything to do with Jesus Christ. And this is why the title of our study today is The Other Jesus. And the question we want to examine is, can you, can I uh, discern the con, the deception? Can we see through it or do we fall for it? Because sadly, when all these cons and scams happen, there are so many people who fall for these scams because they're believable, they sound nice, they promise great things, and on and on and on, depending on what variety or category of scam it is. But when it comes to the one that really matters, the one that is, that is of grave significance, uh, significance that impacts destiny, can we discern the deception? Can we unmask the con? That's what I want to look at. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 4 is uh, our first text. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 4. This is uh, what Paul protests. He says, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if he receive another spirit, which he have not received, or another gospel, which he have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. What's Paul talking about here? Paul was dealing with a problem in Galatia where there are other people coming and preaching uh, a false gospel a twisted gospel, an in incomplete gospel. And Paul was, was really troubled because the, uh, the Corinthians, oh, pardon me, uh, the, the issue was not just in Galatia, the issue was uh, in Corinth. There were false teachers. There were false teachers that were preaching all manner of different ideas and twists when it comes to the gospel. And Paul was alarmed because these people were getting caught up in some of these ideas, like there is no resurrection or uh, this or that or the other thing. And they were getting caught up and Paul was writing and giving this warning. And he, this uh, uh, concern, he's deeply concerned for these people. He says, he, it's like you believe everything. And here's the, what he spells out. There he warns, because if somebody comes and preaches another Jesus that you have not uh, you know, heard preached other than the one I've preached, or you receive another spirit or another gospel, you might well bear with them. What does that mean? Simply means this. There wasn't necessarily someone at the time who was preaching another Jesus yet. And Paul's saying, look, if somebody comes to you with an elaborate uh, gospel that has another savior and another spirit and a whole other gospel uh, mechanic, you might put up with them. You might fall for that. But you're falling for other stuff, stuff that's not even that. But his concern here and the warning is that there is a danger, that there is another Jesus and another spirit and another gospel. This is what I want to spend some time looking at a little bit today. Because this is really none other than an impersonator, a pretender a con, a false Christ, pretending to be the true. 
that people actually end up bearing with or putting up with or accepting and even promoting and defending. So many times we think of uh, an impersonator or a false Christ in physical terms, meaning someone who actually uh, appears and says that they are Jesus. We have that with us today. We had that since the days of Jesus, basically. False Christ, even Jesus warned about them. And we have that today where people say they are Christ and they get some kind of a following. And, and if you have the Bible and you understand it, it, you know, you can straight away know, well, this is obviously wrong. We're not gonna fall for that one. And so it's easy to, to, uh, to detect or to discern someone who just claims to be Jesus because you know, that's, that's not gonna fool us. That's easy to see through. But the thing is this, it doesn't actually have to be an actual person, an actual tangible living person impersonating Jesus or claiming to be Jesus. Because actually the text, warns and Paul anticipates uh, and why he warns about is someone who actually preaches another Jesus. I'll put that up again just to to see clearly uh, what we're talking about here. The warning is about preaching another Jesus that Paul did not preach. So it's really uh, dealing with imposters, not in the way that we commonly know them as a person impersonating someone, but actually someone that is preached or a Jesus that is preached. It has to do with an understanding you see, that's a lot harder to discern because it's not an actual physical person as such. So Paul is saying, beware which Jesus is being preached. What do you put up with? What do you bear with? What do you accept about Jesus? Especially if it's preached contrary to what we preached. Beware which Jesus you accept. And the way you know, the way you discern is actually recorded right there in the verse. Because he says, it's another Jesus whom we have not preached. So all we have to do is ask ourselves a question, which Jesus did Paul preach? Because he says, beware, there might someone, someone might come and preach to you another Jesus, which we have not preached. So which Jesus did Paul preach? Well, the answer is very plain, because if you recall, after Paul's conversion, he began to preach something about Jesus. Here it is, Acts 9, verse 20. And straightway, he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God. This is... The, this is a summary of Paul's first sermon. It's not the full sermon. We don't have a record of that, but we have a record of the summary. And the first thing that Paul ever preached after his conversion is that Christ is the Son of God. That Jesus Christ is none other than the Messiah. That's what Christ means. That is, he is the Son of God. So before that time or before his conversion, that means Paul did not preach that Jesus is the Son of God. He did not even believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He actively opposed and vigorously persecuted those who believed that. So he was on the opposite side of it. When he was converted, he began to preach that Jesus is the Son of God. And his warning is, beware, lest someone preach another Jesus different to the one we preached, the one I preached. And the one he preached was that Christ was the Son of God. And someone might say, well, doesn't everybody believe that? Well, we're going to find out today. That's, that's what we want to find out today. Uh, Paul actually describes his condition before he accepted Jesus, before he began preaching that Jesus is the Son of God. In other words, during the time when he was opposed to the gospel of Christ, he describes it with a very interesting description. Here it is in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. He recounts his experience and notice how he refers to it. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. What do you think about that? Very interesting description. Paul is saying that before he was put into the ministry, he thanks God, you know, uh, Christ Jesus, uh, he, he put him in the ministry. Uh, but before he put him in the ministry, in verse 13, he says, he was before a blasphemer. What does that mean? It means that Paul, before accepting Jesus as the Son of God, in his rejection of that, he refers to himself as a blasphemer. Simply put, to reject that Christ is the Son of God, biblically, equals blasphemy, according to the Apostle Paul. Not only was he a blasphemer, but he actually tells us his experience elsewhere, that he compelled others to blaspheme. In other words, he compelled others to deny the truth about the Messiah or to deny that Christ is indeed the Son of God because those two go hand in hand. The fact that Christ is the Messiah, Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, 
and he is the son of God. They are related. They go together. They stand or fall together, as we will see. But I want us to uh, not miss this particular point here. To deny the truth, the biblical truth about Christ is not just, you know, denying something or you think differently about it. According to Paul, it is blasphemy. He was a blasphemer. Then he was put into the ministry. The first thing he did when he was put into the ministry is preach that Jesus is the son of God. He says, you know what? You know what? Before that time, I was a blasphemer. Now, this makes it important all of a sudden. Because sometimes people today say, well, you know, this this issue about the son of God. And you guys are making a lot of noise over nothing. It's not really that important. It's not that vital. Look at Paul. Someone say, well, well, Paul just rejected Jesus as the Christ. He accepted Jesus as the Christ. That was the issue. All right, well, this is what we want to find out. Is that really only the issue? Or does it have to do with the fact that Christ is indeed the Son of God? His very first sermon, summarized by Luke, is clear enough indication. He preached that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So we're going to look at that a little bit. Because today, there are many, uh, preach many people preaching about Jesus. There are many uh, Jesuses being preached. Because this is the warning of Paul. If uh, someone comes and preaches another Jesus. And the foundation for what I want to talk about next is this. Our concept of God really determines our worship of him and our walk with him. I want to repeat that. Our concept of God determines how we worship him and also will manifest in how we walk with him. In other words, our practical daily walk, our relationship with God is a fruit and a result of what concept we have about God. That's why when Paul warned about another Jesus being preached, he also warned about another spirit and another gospel. There's a whole package that goes with the foundation of which Jesus do you have? Which Jesus is being preached? Which Jesus have you accepted? It will lead to another spirit. It will lead to another gospel. And therefore, a whole other experience altogether. What you believe about God and about Christ will influence and impact your experience and your walk with him. Today, there are a variety of views and teachings about God, which have a direct bearing on the Jesus or which Jesus is being preached. Now, like I said, uh, the warning of Paul has indeed materialized because not only are people bearing with such teachings about Jesus, but they actually happily accept them, promote them, and even defend them with sometimes great zeal. Now, first of all, I want to look at a few of them. Uh, the first one I want to put on the screen is the most prevalent, the most common teaching about God that exists in Christendom today, known as the Trinity. This concept of God, uh, as confusing as it is, as, as hard as people find, uh, try and make, uh, as difficult as it is for people to understand, it is still the most commonly accepted views, uh, view about God today. It is the one that's in all the creeds, you know, Nicene Creed, Athanasian Creed, the Trinity, the, the, tr the traditional, the Orthodox Trinity. What does the Trinity say about the Son of God? This is the focus here today. They want to talk about uh, the Sonship of Christ and which Jesus is being preached in this particular concept of God. And we'll look at a few others because we're examining. Is this another Jesus or is this the biblical Jesus? Are we to bear with them or are we actually to reject them or recognize them as a con, as a falsehood? How is our discernment? When it comes to the Son of God in the, in the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, there is something referring to the Son of God called the eternal generation. And eternal generation is many times uh, the way that people actually say, well, you know, what you guys share about the Son of God, it's exactly the same as uh, the Catholic Trinity because they believe in the eternal generation. You believe Christ is begotten. That's the same thing. See, it's Catholic. No, not at all. It's actually not the same thing. The doctrine of eternal generation teaches that Christ is eternally generated by a ceaseless action of the Father. Something that never had a beginning something that is ongoing and something that will never have an end. It's an ongoing, eternal process. It's an eternal generation. The important thing to note about that, it's a process. It's not an event. And if you think, well, this doesn't make sense. How can I make sense of that? It's because this is really a philosophical concept. It's not a reality because the Trinity God is really a philosophical concept. God is not tangible. As far as the concept of God as a Trinity, God is not a real, tangible person. He has no body or parts. It's really a philosophical concept. And within this philosophical concept, there is this explanation for father, son, and spirit. And when it comes to this son, he's explained to be eternally generated, this ongoing ceaseless process with no beginning and no end. And this is how it is defined. It has no 
bearing on reality. There is no, no reality. There's no, nothing tangible about it. Okay, this is why I'm saying it's a philosophical concept. Of course, this idea of the Trinity is simply uh, summarized that God is one being made up of three persons. There are three persons in the one God making up this uh, Trinity. This is why there is a problem with the Trinity when it comes to the Son of God. That's what we're saying. This is another Jesus that's being preached. It's actually very different to what Paul preached. Paul never preached this about the Son of God. Never once did he talk about eternal gen generation being eternally begotten or something from no beginning and no end and ongoing process because as far as Paul was concerned, Jesus was a real person. He had a real relationship to his father. It's not just a philosophical concept. It's not a philosophical construct. So this is as far as that particular point is concerned. There is another teaching, uh, closely uh, uh, different varieties of teaching. We're gonna examine a few varieties and we wanna hone in, like I said, uh, focusing on the sonship of Christ. What do they preach about Jesus? Because Paul warns that there is another Jesus being preached. Be aware of that. And we want to see what significance is all this uh, uh, for us, especially in the last days. Does it have any bearing? Are we making a lot of noise over nothing? Much ado about nothing. Are we just making some noise to attract people to our, you know, uh, special view of things and we're trying to infuse some importance into it? Or is it actually important biblically? That's what I want to discover. That's why I want to understand. Because many people ask this. They say, look, you're getting to the technicalities. All that is not really that important. You guys are overcomplicating things. Well, if that's the case, then Paul's warning has no bearing. Is Paul's warning just in the air? It's useless? No, it's useful. The fact that we see so many varieties and so many ideas being preached about Jesus or so many different Jesus is being preached indicates to us that his warning is most definitely in place. And he warns that one thing will lead to another. A wrong Jesus leads to a wrong spirit and a wrong gospel. The other idea I want to discuss is also starts with a T. It's called tritheism. Tritheism is uh, illustrated this way. It's similar to the Trinity, but it's different. Basically, it says that God is three beings, not one. Okay, three individual beings. And in essence, what this boils down to is three gods. This is polytheism. So there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and uh, it's not uh, these three are are one in uh, you know three persons in one in one God or one being. No, they're actually three. Uh, independent beings. They're independent of each other, meaning uh, one is not the source of the other, one did not come out of the other or anything of the sort. They're three individual God beings. They are the ultimate three sources in the universe. They are only uh, one in the sense that they are in agreement. So you could have four and if they agree, they would be one. If you had a hundred and they happen to agree, uh, they would still say it's one. It's a oneness of unity or uh, being united, not a oneness of that there is actually one God who is worshipped. That's why it is actually three gods. What does it say about the Son of God? That's what we're going to focus on. What does it teach about the Son? Well, you, you would have figured it out already. Uh, the Son was not begotten. There is no real sonship. He never came out of the Father. He was never uh, brought forth. He never proceeded forth from the Father. And this is not dealing with the eternal generation. That's, that's in the Trinity. The sonship of Christ, as far as tritheism is concerned, is only a metaphor. It's only a role play. He pretends to be the son or plays the role of the son because he's actually God number two, independent of the Father. He never came from the Father. He didn't receive anything from the Father, just like God, the Holy Spirit as well. Three gods, and they take on these titles. They take on these roles. And the sonship of Christ is nothing better than a metaphor in this particular uh, idea of God. Paul never preached such, such a thing about the Son. And so this denial of the Sonship of Christ actually amounts to the same thing that Paul was, or same condition that Paul was in before he was put into the ministry, where he referred to himself as a blasphemer, rejecting that Christ is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Messiah, is rejecting Jesus as the Son of God. And Paul put himself in the category of a blasphemer when he did that. This teaching about Jesus qualifies for the same label. It is blasphemy. Why? It denies that Christ is the Son of God. And we'll see that as, as we go along. Hopefully, we'll demonstrate what we're talking about with, with some evidence and proof from the scripture. But I just want to show you how the warning of Paul has come uh, about, has come to fruition in alarming ways. The, not only is there another Jesus being preached, but there is more than one. There's multiple ones. 
but there's one common denominator whereby we can identify if it's the true Jesus or if it's one of the other ones or if it's the, uh, the other Jesus, hence the title of this study. The other idea that exists about God, uh, concepts about God that shape our understanding and therefore our views of Christ is modalism. Modalism is also known as oneness, oneness theology or Jesus only. And to summarize it, this basically says that God is only one person, one individual who appears as the father in the Old Testament and the same one, he appears as the son when he came here to earth and he also, the same one, appears as the Holy Spirit. It, that's why it says it's Jesus only. It's actually Jesus who is the father, who is the son, who is the Holy Spirit. There is really no one else. And in this idea, it's very quick to see why there is a problem when it comes to the sonship of Christ. Therefore, there is no real son. Uh, these are different modes in which God appears. He appears in the mode of father, mode of son, mode of the spirit. And uh, therefore, there is no real sonship. It's none other than a role play. And like I said uh, before, with tritheism, this really amounts to a denial of the son. And this denial of the son, we already saw what Paul referred to it when he uh, expressed his uh, category before his conversion. Blasphemer. This is blasphemy. And another one I want to look at, uh, and this is the final one in this list, covering the most common ideas that exist about God. Now, all these ideas, uh, people, there are a lot of people believe this today. Modalism or oneness theology, that's very common uh, among Pentecostals, uh, in, uh, among uh, evangelicals. Now, there's, there's shades of, you know, there's shades of overlap, and it's not necessarily always uh, uh, restricted to one particular denomination. But in people's understandings, these are some of the most common ideas among Christianity that are taught about God. Trinity, tritheism, and this one, modalism, or Jesus only. That God takes uh, different modes, different uh, appearances. The final one I want to talk about, like I said, is also in this list because it is quite common, and that is, the Unitarian view of God or Unitarianism. And Unitarianism, as illustrated there, teaches that there is only one God, the Father. Jesus is not really anything other than a good man. He was born on earth and this is when he began his existence. He was a good man, he was a prophet, but he was a creature. He's created. His sonship to God is on the base of the fact that is based on the fact that he is created. In, in a sense, it's an adoption, so to speak. So this denies the true sonship of Christ to the Father. It makes the sonship of Christ just like Adam. Adam was created, and so he's a son of God by creation. Jesus was created. He was a good man. He was a prophet. He was full of the Spirit of God, and he referred to him as the Son of God. But he did not really pre-exist Bethlehem. So it denies the pre-existence of Christ. It denies the sonship of Christ biblically, which we will come to. We will see. So this is as far as uh, Unitarianism is concerned. Same problem when it comes to the Son. Another Jesus is being preached. So I'm just showing these uh, uh, examples of all these different views about God that exist, that are common among uh, Christen Christendom today, just to show that the words of Paul have come true uh, more than he perhaps even realized or anticipated. There is another Jesus preached in every one of these concepts. The question is this, can we discern, can you Uncover, uncover the con? Can you unmask the deception or do you fall for the deception? Paul was worried that the Corinthians might just might bear with someone who comes with an elaborate system of a whole different gospel with another Jesus and another spirit and therefore another gospel. And this is many times what ends up happening, brothers and sisters. These false concepts of God, particularly relating to the identity of Christ, end up giving people a false gospel or another gospel, an experience that does not match with what God really desires for them or for us. That if you trace it, you'll find many times it is traced back to the root, which is the concept of God that people have in their mind. This is why it's so important. This is why it's important to Christ. Now, you might say, well, you're saying it's important. You keep saying it's important, but we haven't seen any evidence that it's important. Uh, notice how. The teaching of Paul about Jesus comes directly from the scriptures. I want to compare two verses here when it comes to the sonship of Christ and see what we can learn. First one is very familiar, but I want to repeat it because I want to link it with this other verse from Paul. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Why did I put this on the screen? We can recite it from memory. Uh, the reason I put it here is th the verse means exactly what it says. God's love and the measure of God's love for man was demonstrated in a real gift. 
God's love is real. He gave a real gift. He gave a real person. The person he gave was his only begotten son. That means God had a son to give, quite simply. The problem is that so many times people read this verse and limit the sonship of Christ and apply it only to the incarnation. Meaning this, they think God loved the world, so he gave his begotten son, and this is when the son was begotten, when he was here on earth. But that's not what the verse says. The verse doesn't say God so loved the world that he had a son. The verse says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You see, God did not have a son at Bethlehem. That's the first time he had a son. No, God already had a son from the beginning, as we will see. His only begotten son who was with him from the beginning. Not, uh, not begotten as a philosophical concept or some role play or some metaphor. It was real. It was an event that happened, not an endless process like eternal generation teaches, an actual event that happened. And that happened before he was sent. And we'll see that in the next verse. And that is the measure of God's love. This is actually what the verse says. And there's a big difference between God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that means he had a son to give, or God so loved the world that he had a son. That means the sonship commenced when, the, when he came to earth. There's a big difference. Now we saw Unitarians, uh, teaches or Unitarianism teaches that this is when Christ actually came into existence and therefore is the son of God by this process, by the, his incarnation, but he didn't have a pre-existence. The next verse I wanted to compare from Paul, because we're looking at the Jesus that Paul preached. This is the warning. It's in Galatians 4.4. 4. He says, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law. This is how Paul understood John 3.16. He might not have had the, you know, the opportunity to read it. That's not, that's not what I'm trying to say. But his understanding of the truth encapsulated in John 3.16 is expressed here in his own words. And they match up. They line up. They, they complement each other. That's the point I'm making. When the fullness of the time was come, that's the time for the Savior to be born, God sent forth his son. In other words, God already had a son, a real son, not a make-believe son, not a pretending son a real son, as we will see. And he sent that son to be born of a woman. In other words, the sonship of Christ to the father predates the incarnation. That is what John 3.16 is talking about. That's why in the gospel of John, you see that uh, the apostle says, Christ was the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. He wasn't uh, begotten on earth only uh, of Mary. He was the only begotten of the father, existing with him from the beginning. From when uh, the commencement of the gospel says in the beginning was the word, he's talking about the only begotten of the Father. This is what this is uh, referring to. This is what uh, Paul understood in Galatians 4 and verse 4. So two things here. Sonship precedes being sent or Bethlehem. This is the, uh, the Jesus that Paul preached. The Son of God, brothers and sisters, is not just something that applies to Christ here on earth. This is the beautiful truth. As a matter of fact, if you remember, the whole Gospel of John was written for this purpose. The Gospel of John, at the end of it, uh, John says, all these things, the signs that Jesus did, uh, they are written for one reason, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And it's interesting that in the Gospel of John, Jesus actually spells out very plainly what his sonship really means. He kind of defines it for us. He shows us it's not a metaphor, it's not a make-believe, it's not a role play, it's not an eternal generation, it's not an endless process that is just philosophical. He shows us it's an actual event that occurred because there is a before and there is an after, as we will see. Here it is, uh, John 8, verse 42, spelled out by Jesus himself. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Jesus speaking to the unbelieving Jews who professed a love and a regard for God, but no regard or acceptance of Christ and his, uh, what he was saying, he told them, listen, if, if God is really your father, as you claim, you would love me because I have a real relationship to God. That real relationship is I proceeded forth and came from him. If you look up in the Greek, what that means, it literally means I came out from God. What Jesus is talking about here, he is spelling out what it means that he is the only begotten of the father. He was begotten. He came out from God. Now, this is an actual event. It's not an endless process like eternal generation says in, uh, in the doctrine of the Trinity. It's an actual event that occurred at one time. It's not still uh, ongoing. It's not still uh, recurring or, or ongoing for the future. We know that it's an event that occurred because following that event, something else happened. That's why I'm saying there is a before and after. He says, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. 
So the fact that Jesus was sent by the Father shows that the sending happens after the fact that he came out from God. Therefore, he was the son of God before he was sent here to earth, which is what John 3.16 talks about, which is the Jesus that Paul preached according to Galatians 4.4, 4, which we just read. God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. That is spelled out by Jesus himself. What you get from this, simply, is that the sonship of Christ is a central, integral component to his identity. It really makes up his identity and his messiahship. The fact that he is sent as the Messiah, what qualified him to be sent as the Messiah is because of the relation he has to the Father. It's a real relation. That's why it can be a metaphor, it can be a make-believe, it can be a role play, it, it can be a philosophical concept or a construct, and you can't deny it outright like the Unitarians do. See, all these false teachings about Jesus run into straight conflict with the plain word of Scripture. Jesus says, I proceeded forth and came from God. That is just as real as the fact that God sent him. Two different events, one happened before the other. That's why we know it's an event that happened, it's over. Now he's sent, yeah, well now the time when he was speaking to the Pharisees and now he's back in heaven. These are, these are chronological events. We can, we can put them on a timeline, so to speak. Christ was begotten of the Father. It's important to note also, the fact that Christ says here, came forth from God, uh, doesn't mean that he was created. Some people mistake that. We're not talking about Christ being created. That is, a, that is another fallacy. That is another false Jesus that is preached there are some people who believe that Jesus was created. No, Jesus says he came out from God. He's from the very substance of the Father. He has the very nature of the Father, the real nature of the Father, not by make-believe, but by inheritance, because he is truly begotten of God. He was begotten, not created. Vast difference. Lucifer, to illustrate that, Lucifer, uh, the first of the angels, it was, he was created, the foremost, that is. Uh, he was created out of nothing. Christ was not created. He's not in the same category as Lucifer. Christ was begotten of God. He's the only begotten Son of God. And that is why Christ is the only one who with the Father receives worship, glory, and honor. That's, that's the point Jesus is making here. So it's a real sonship. Now, this entails uh, some other real aspects, such as just to show us the reality of this sonship. Let's go to John chapter 5 and verse 26 and see just how real is this sonship. John chapter 5 and verse 26. Jesus says, for as the father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the son to have life in himself. I want you to pause and think here about the words we're reading. Jesus is actually talking about his sonship here. The reality of his sonship now is expressed in the fact that he has received something based on that. Just like the father has life in himself, he gave to the son to have that same life. What kind of life is that? That's self-existent life. That's the divine life of God. It was given to the son. Well, when was that given to the son? Not when he came to earth. That's not when he became the son of God. He actually came to earth because he had, he alone in the whole universe had that life like the father. That's based on the fact that he was the son of God from the beginning. This is an important point to keep in mind. The sonship of Christ is real because his inheritance based on that sonship is real. He inherited the real life that he came to give us. Our reception of life is real. Because he has a real life, because his sonship is real. All these things are real. As soon as you start denying one, or as soon as you start spiritualizing away one, you are like a domino effect. You affect everything else that's based on it. The messiahship of Christ is based on the fact that he's the son of God. It's based on the fact that he has the life that the father gave him. All of that is based on his sonship, like we're saying. And our reception of eternal life is based on all of that. You play with the sonship, you affect everything else. That's why it's so vital. That's why it's so important. That's why Paul warned against preaching another Jesus or particularly uh, receiving another Jesus. Now, some people struggle with this and say, well, how, how can, how can the, the father give the son to have life in himself? That's what Jesus said. It might not fit with your uh, pre-accepted concept of God that you accepted. If you accept there are three independent uh, you know, persons or God beings, whether it be Trinity or Tritheism, that don't uh, rely on each other for life and not, not, not one, one did not receive life from the other, then of course these words will not make sense. Of course there will be a conflict. And this is why we need to examine what we believe. The concept of the Trinity or the concept of Tritheism teaches that there are three individual persons or beings, depending on which one, that are independent nobody got life from the other one. This goes totally contrary to the words of Jesus here, particularly showing the reality of his sonship and that it's something that we can understand as far as it is revealed. It's not some uh, mysterious, uh, self-contradictory philosophical concept. The life that Jesus has is what you and I receive. That's why the son alone can give us life. 
He that has the son, the Bible says, has life. Where did that life come from? It came from the father. The father is the ultimate source of all things in the universe. He is the source of all life. Even the life of the son comes from the father. That's why he's called the son of God. Now he repeated this. It's not the only place he said it, but he repeated this a little later to emphasize this particular point. In John 6 verse 57, this is what he says. As the living father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. I want you to think about that as well. You know, it's, 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 it's nice to be able to read the words of Scripture and just pause and, and consider what are they saying to us, rather than rushing into, oh, this must mean that, and this mean, must mean the other thing. Just pause and think. Jesus is now making a comparison. He says, as the living Father had sent me. Now, that's a real event. We saw that this is an event that follows him being uh, brought forth from the Father. He says, I proceeded forth and came from God and he sent me. So there is begotten of the Father, then he's sent. And then he says, I live by the Father. What does that mean? Someone will say, well, that's only on earth. You see what Jesus said this in John 6. He already said in John 5, what we saw earlier, that as the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself. In other words, the Son has self-existent life. But he credits the Father with that life. That's why he says, I live by the Father. In other words, the source of the life that I have is the Father. He's not claiming to have independent life of the Father. This is the point here. The life that he has was given to him by the Father. This is what he means when he says, I live by the Father. You have to take his words in context together. You don't just take them isolated. Now, to, to prove this or to confirm that this is the case, notice what he goes on to say in the verse. So he that eateth me, he that partakes of me, he that believes on me and receives me, what ends up happening? Even he shall live by me. In other words, Jesus becomes the source of life for us. We live by him. He is life to us. Just like the father was life to him because he has a real relationship with the father. He's his only begotten son. He received life. So also we are adopted into the family of Christ. We become true children of his. We receive his life. We live by him. You see the pattern here. You can't break that pattern. And Jesus is most definitely not just referring to his uh, earthly sojourn or his uh, into the time of his incarnation when he's talking about the fact that the father has life in himself. He gave him to have life in himself and he lives by the father. Because sometimes people will say, well, Jesus was living by the father just on earth here. He, he was dependent on the father. He was just, you know, relying on his father. This is what he means when he says, I live by the father. Well, you can't forget John 5 that we just read earlier was also when he was here on earth, where Jesus says he was given to have life in himself by the Father. That's when he was here on earth. So that doesn't mean now he's independent because he said that when he was on earth. So is the life that Jesus has totally independent of the Father, his on his own, or is the, the source of that life the Father? You find that it's actually consistent. The source of that life is the Father. It's not just talking about what happened here on earth. Because guess what? When, when Christ came to earth, that's not the time when he actually received life from the father for the first time that's not when he came into existence he pre-existed and how he pre-existed as the son of god means he had life he was alive he wasn't a concept he wasn't just the word of god as an idea in god's mind that would materialize one day when the incarnation happens as uh, the unitarians teach no he was an actual individual person who was alive and well he was the son of god he could bestow life all creation happened through him in other words he had that life in him given by the Father from the very beginning, from when he proceeded forth and came from God. So when he came here to earth, he's revealing a truth that's not now happening for the first time. It's something that, ha it's how things were from the beginning. That's why he qualified to be the one who comes here to earth. So when he says, I live by the Father here on earth, he's not limiting that. He says, listen, the life that I have actually comes from the Father. I live by the Father because that's how you are going to live as well. Real sonship, real life, that's what Jesus came to teach. This is the Jesus that Paul preached. And he says, be careful, lest you accept another Jesus. Someone that we did not preach, which leads to all these other results that we looked at. Why does the sonship of Christ matter? And someone say, look, why does all this really matter? Uh, I'll tell you why it matters. Because hopefully, as you have seen, it is the foundation for everything about Christ. His Sending as the Messiah, the life that he has, the life that he bestows to us or he gives to us. All of that is based on the sonship. Because, like we said, uh, it's not just that there is one other Jesus being preached. There are many today in these many different concepts. Why does the sonship also matter? Because 
the fatherhood of God also matters. You see, but all people don't realize how you impact, what you say about the sonship of Christ, if you turn it into a metaphor, spiritualize it, or turn it into a philosophical concept, you are affecting the fatherhood of God in exactly the same way, immediately. Because the sonship of Christ and the fatherhood of God are related. If he's a real son, it's because he's a real father. If he's a metaphorical son, he's a metaphorical father. So why does the sonship matter? Because the fatherhood of God matters. It's real. And the other thing is this. Why does the sonship of Christ matter? You know why? Because it actually mattered to Jesus Christ himself. This is not something that we're trying to make and give it some importance that it, that it, it doesn't have. The sonship of Christ actually mattered to Jesus himself. And to his father too, we'll see that. But I want to look at how Jesus expressed how important this was. This, this is so relevant for us today, this conversation. Matthew 16, uh, from verse 13 down to 17, Jesus has a conversation with his disciples. He asks them some questions. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? What, do people, what are people saying about me? What is being circulated about me among the people? What is being preached and what is being believed about me? That's the question. And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Why is this question so important? Jesus here is illustrating the, the warning, the danger that Paul actually gave to the Corinthians. The danger was this. There's, there's uh, other Jesus being preached. Different views about Jesus exist. And Jesus here was taking a poll, so to speak. He says, look, what are people saying about me? What are the views that are out there that exist? And then he got a variety of answers. Today, we have a variety of answers as well when it comes to Christ. Who is he as the son of God? Some say, instead of saying John the Baptist, instead of saying Elias and Jeremiah, today, some say, well, he's the eternally uh, generated uh, son. Or some say, well, he's the metaphorical son. Some say he's the role-playing son. Some say, well, he's the son only when he was born in Bethlehem. He didn't pre-exist that time. So there's different things that people are saying about Jesus. But the concern of Jesus, as far as his true believers is, he turns to them and says, listen, what about you? Who do you say that I am? In other words, can you discern the con? Can you discern the deception? Can you discern between the true and the false? As believers in me, what do you say? So in other words, something now matters to Jesus as far as his true identity being understood by his apostles, by his disciples. Now it goes on. You know the rest of the verse, but let's read it from verse 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. My Father which is in heaven. A direct revelation from God to Peter concerning the true identity of the Messiah. This revelation is identical to what the Father himself declared publicly at the baptism of Jesus, also at the Mount of Transfiguration. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So Simon Peter here indicated very clearly the faith of the disciples, not just him, but the disciples, the believers in Christ, those who truly accept him, like Paul. This is what Paul would have understood. This is what Paul would have preached, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, and that means he is the son of the living God. The two go hand in hand, like we said earlier. The Son of God, the Sonship of Christ to the, to the Father, Him being the Son of God, is just as real as His Messiahship. His Messiahship was not a role play, wasn't a metaphor, it wasn't uh, some kind of philosophical uh, process, it was a reality. In like manner, His Sonship is a reality. And Jesus was concerned enough and satisfied enough with the answer of Peter, He was concerned enough to ask about it, to make sure the disciples have it right, and to ask about it, like I said, and to then answer Peter, like he said uh, later, we won't read it, but he says he's going to build his church on this and the gates of hell are not going to be able to prevail. In other words, the foundation for the church is based on the identity of Christ being the real and begotten son of God, which is the foundation for his messiahship. This is the, the Jesus that Paul preached. So when people say, why, why does the sonship matter? It matters to Jesus. It matters to the Father. It matters to the true believers. And Jesus wanted to make sure that they understand and they don't catch the different ideas that are there that might seem to honor Christ to a certain degree, a certain measure, but they fall short of the full scope and full reality. Because, you know, people who say Jesus is a prophet, they, they're seeking to honor Christ. People who say Jesus is, you know, is God in his own right, independent of the Father. They're seeking to honor Christ. But all these ways are seeking to honor Christ that are not what God has revealed about his son. This is what matters. We cannot, this is an important point, we cannot honor Christ more than God the Father himself honors his son.
And how did God the Father honor his son? The greatest honor, the, the greatest status he, is when he revealed to us his true identity at the baptism, in his own words, what he revealed to Peter right here. This is my, uh, this is my beloved son. To Peter, he says, thou art the son of the living God. That's a revelation from God. In other words, the father himself is, is lifting his son to his full and true measure and stature and status. That's what makes Christ divine with the father. So you can't exceed the father and think you're going to honor Christ more than the father. You say, oh, no, no, son of God is not good enough. We're going to call him God the son. We're going to make him God in his own right, independent of the father. You're actually dishonoring both the son and the father. Beware. So the sonship matters. It's important. That's why Paul gave that warning. Uh, practically, I want to I want to make this practical here today. Here's how Jesus puts it in Mark 12 and verse 30. I'll just conclude with, with some practical thoughts uh, to, to draw all this together. Because a lot of people ask this question. Why, why does it matter? Why, what's all this about? Here's how Jesus puts it. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. The first commandment is to love God with the whole being. Part of that being is to love God with, with the mind. You know what that means? The understanding. That's why we said false concepts about God will impact our relationship with him. Jesus wants us to love God with our mind, with our understanding, with our comprehension. To love God is directly related to what concept of God you have. That's why the verse preceding this, the, Jesus says, the first thing you need to know is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God. In other words, you need to identify God correctly, the one who is going to be the object of your supreme love and worship and that relationship. You need to have the right idea of who God is. Guess what? God is only one. That's why he quoted that verse from Deuteronomy. So this idea that uh, knowing or, or who we worship is not important or doesn't really matter, especially in the last days, is actually a grave deception. It's a grave deception that we really need to watch out for. Loving God is not just about theology. To love God, as Jesus indicates here, is not a, a theological position or a theological interpretation. Loving God with the heart, mind, soul, and strength is actually a way of life that impacts your actions, your behavior. It stems from how you relate to God here, how you understand him will be revealed in your behavior, in the mind. That's what it means to love God with all your mind. Think about it. What does Jesus mean? He says, you love God with all your mind? That would involve some kind of understanding, an understanding of God, who he is an understanding of his son, who he really is. That's why it matters. That's why there is actually a deception about this. The fact that so many deceptions exist about the sonship of Christ should be evidence enough for anyone that sonship does matter. Why would Satan manufacture so many different ideas and so many controversies and so many oppositions when it comes to the sonship of Christ? There's so many varieties. Why? Because it matters. And Satan knows this. It matters all the way to the end as well. Notice in Revelation 14 and verse 1. And I looked and behold, sir, and I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion and with him 140 and 4,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. All the way to the end, the true worshipers known as the 144,000, they have the father's name written in the forehead. Now they're standing with the lamb, that's the son of God. And the description here is very interesting. I don't want us to miss that. It says they have his father's name written in their forehead. It doesn't say they have the father's name. It says they have his father's name. In other words, they know that this is the son of God and they have his father's name in their forehead, in their understanding, in their mind. They love God with all their mind because they understand and they know who they worship and they stand with the son who they know to be the son of God. They have his father's name. That's a real father. Okay, so the, what you get from this point is that's a real father. That lines up exactly with what Jesus declared about himself, with what G Paul preached about Jesus in, uh, you know, in the verses that we covered and with what's revealed in the whole New Testament when it comes to Christ. So these 144,000 are preaching, believing the same Jesus that Paul preached. This is the true identity that they have of Christ. It impacts their behavior. It impacts their actions. It impacts their life. They have a connection with God in such a way that they stand through this whole time of trouble and they end up standing with the Lamb on Mount Zion. Quite simply, they know the Father and the Son. This is what we're talking about here. In contrast to this, in contrast to this, you have this particular problem that also began from uh, apostolic times and also leads all the way to the end. And it has to do with the same issue. Jude warns about it in Jude 1 and verse 4. For there are certain men, crept in unawares, 
who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Here Jude warns about false professors who come into the body of believers, into the church. And what do they do? They, they, they cause all kinds of trouble. And he summarizes it by saying, they deny the only Lord God, that's God the Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, that's the Son of God. How do they deny God? It's not like they're atheists or they preach atheism. They're not saying God doesn't exist, don't nobody believe in God. No, they deny the Father and the Son by teaching different ideas, false concepts about God, preaching another Jesus. That's why we're talking about the other Jesus today. Can you discern the other Jesus? Today, this is a prevalent common problem among the churches. There is a teaching that actually denies the Father and the Son, different varieties of it. We examined some of the most popular ones, Trinitarianism, Tritheism, Modalism, Unitarianism. We looked at how all these things deny the only Lord God, the fatherhood of God, and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Sonship of Christ. It changes it. It twists it. Just like the people in the days of Jesus say, oh, he's John the Baptist, he's Elijah, he's Jeremiah, he's one of the prophets. All kinds of different teachings about Jesus. And notice how this actually persists to the very last days. In contrast with the 144,000 who know the Father and the Son, they have his name in their forehead. Notice how this persists. The Apostle John tells us in 1 John 2, 22. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Antichrist is the power that operates, not just in the days of John, not just in the days of the apostles, but all the way to the end. The, the power that is used by Satan to deceive the whole world, it has something to do with denying the Father and the Son. What does that mean? The Antichrist is not an atheist. This power is a religious power. It professes faith in God. And yet at the same time, it denies the Father and the Son. How? By teaching false concepts about God that end up denying the fatherhood of God and the sonship of Christ. That's how you deny the Father and the Son. He's not a real father. He doesn't have a real son. It's a concept. It's a metaphor. It's a role play. It's whatever you want to call it. It's another Jesus. That is what Paul warned about. There is a grave deception, brothers and sisters. That is why it is important. That's why we talk about it. It's not something that we made up. It's right there in the scriptures, revealed time and again by God himself. So the fake Jesus in the last days, the false Jesus, the other Jesus, many, sadly, many believe him. Many have accepted him already. Have you fallen for that trap? You see, the, the, the point here in sharing this is not trying to condemn people. We're, we're trying to uncover false teaching. So many times people hear this say, well, look, you know, does that mean all, anyone who doesn't agree with you, you're just saying they're going to be lost and uh, all, that's it? No, we're not saying that. God saves people despite false concepts. We know we're well aware of that. But that doesn't, that doesn't justify the false concept. That doesn't turn something that is wrong into truth. The Bible says God winks at the times of our ignorance, but he desires men to repent. He desires us to give up the false ideas so that we can come into a fuller understanding because it's not just about have the right theology and we'll be saved so that you can have the matching experience that goes along with it. That's the whole point. So this is not a message to condemn people who believe anything differently. It's a message to show that there is false teachings that exist that are deceiving people. And it's an appeal to undeceive people. That's, that's the whole idea behind it. And like I said, I want, I want to address this uh, too. That and People say, look, honestly, it sounds like you're making a big fuss over this. We already saw it was important to Jesus, right? Uh, it was important to Paul to give that warning. It was important to John to write his gospel. It was important enough for Satan to question Jesus about it in the wilderness. He says, if thou be the son of God. We already saw it was important enough for the father to declare it with his own voice from heaven. You know, uh, all, these, all these things show you that this is something that is relevant. This is not something that's a side issue. Uh, it's important enough for the 144,000 to have the father's name, his father's name in their forehead. It's important enough for the Antichrist to deny. He denies the father and the son. So it is important enough. This is, this is how the great controversy actually is operating. It started at the very beginning over this particular point. So this is why eternal life is actually to know the Father and the Son. This is my concluding verse. Close with it because it's so relevant. It touches on what we talked about so beautifully. Eternal life, according to Jesus. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So does it really matter? Eternal life is all about it. That's how much it matters. Now, this is not just a theological knowledge of God. So don't comfort yourself. Well, I understand the truth about God. No, it is a personal knowledge of God the Father based on a correct understanding of who he is and a personal knowledge of Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, based 
on a true understanding of who he is because that's how you can really appreciate him for who he is that's how you can love him with all your mind because that involves your understanding so eternal life is to only know the father and the son you know uh, sometimes people say look this is just terminologies i know jesus i love jesus i don't have to believe all these technicalities when it comes to his sonship i just believe he's a son this way he's a son that way and in, in essence, they basically say, look, it doesn't really matter. Let me tell you something. It matters which day, on which day you worship God, doesn't it? A lot of people, especially who keep the Sabbath, say, yes, it does matter. That's important. On which day? How much more the God of that day, the Lord of the Sabbath? And you, you, you won't be satisfied if somebody says, listen, I, I go to church on Sunday, but I call it the Sabbath. That should be okay, right? And I say, well, well not, not really. Just changing the name doesn't really alter it. It, it matters. How much more when it comes to the Son of God? So this is not just technicalities. These are not just semantics that we're talking about here, brothers and sisters. We're talking about the reality of eternal life. It is to know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. This is the practical application of what we're talking about. It's not a head knowledge so that we can have that heart relationship with God to truly love him, to manifest that love in our behavior, in our actions, in our walk with him daily. Let us indeed have the Father's name written in our forehead. His father's name because we know the father and the son that's my appeal and that's my challenge to you let's close with a word of prayer together father in heaven thank you so much that your word is clear that your word is true thank you so much for loving us and giving us your only begotten and well beloved son i just pray father that this message will, will be clear to those listening i know there are so many different ideas that exist uh, there are so many people that say all kinds of different things and and uh, People find it difficult who to listen to, who to believe. I just pray that you will give your spirit to bring conviction of truth to the hearts of every listener. Those who might be wondering, those who are sitting on the fence, those who are questioning some of these things, that they might have that realization and confirmation that Peter also received when he declared, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it was a revelation from the Father. We thank you so much for revealing this truth to us, your word. Thank you for the leading of your spirit in our lives and for this time together. And we ask your blessing. and your, uh, your seal in our hearts, that we might indeed be faithful and true to the end, to have your name written in our foreheads, because we know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. We ask this in the wonderful name of your only begotten Son, Jesus. Amen. I pray you were blessed by this video. Be sure to subscribe to our channel, like, turn notifications on, and most importantly, share this video with others. May God the Father richly bless you in Jesus.